Good day, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to our second installment of the uh, free open uh, lunch and learn sessions with Len Pierre Consulting. Uh, it is such an honor and a privilege to be able to welcome and introduce you to my good friend and colleague, Marissa, who will be guiding today's session on Indigenous cultural appropriation versus appreciation. Um, so here is Marissa's biography. Uh, Marissa McIntyre, her ancestral name is Konechko. She is of mixed settler and First Nations of uh, the Inglatmic uh, First Nation, born and raised in Surrey, British Columbia. Marissa holds a bachelor's degree uh, in First Nation studies from Simon Fraser University. Marissa has previously worked for the Fraser Regional uh, Aboriginal Friendship Center Association from 2018 to 2021. Uh, as an Indigenous uh, at-risk youth worker and cultural night coordinator before starting her current role with the Fraser Health Authority as our, our Indigenous cultural safety educator. Marissa has worked hard to reconnect with her culture over the last 10 years and is constantly learning. She is so grateful for the opportunity she has been given to work alongside so many talented and knowledgeable Indigenous people as well as the opportunity to serve her people by striving for system changes and widespread education. As an associate consultant with LPC, Marissa provides training on Indigenous cultural safety and humility, Indigenous trauma and equity and foreign practice, appropriation versus appreciation, decolonizing substance use, and transformative territory acknowledgements. So um, it is uh, such an honor and, and pleasure to, eat, to introduce you to my friend, Marissa, over to you. Thank you so much for that that super warm introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Len already introduced me, but again, my name is Marissa McIntyre. Um, I am in Tlaqatma on my dad's side and Mick Settler on my mom's side. Um, and my traditional name is Konechko, which means helping water in my language. Um, I'm so grateful to be here today. I'm so grateful for Len. Um, you know, this persona that you see of this really humble and gracious human being, that's really who he is as a person. Um, so there's no, there's no smoke and mirrors. This is exactly who Len is. What you see is what you get. And I'm so grateful for you, um, Len, for uplifting my voice and giving me these opportunities and allowing me space on your platform. So thank you so much for having me today. Um, bear with me a little bit while I share my screen and then kind of get everything settled in my mind. Um, you may, for those of you that, um, oh, for those of you <laughs> that um, that missed missed the intro there, um, my cat Pants might make an appearance. And right now she is definitely making her presence known. Um, so if you wanted to say hi to her, I'm, I'm sure she'd love it. Um, so today we are going over appropriation versus appreciation. Um, again, my name is Marissa McIntyre with Len Pierre Consulting as an associate consultant. Um, and today I, I kind of wanted to, start off with a practice of humility. Um, I'm about to do a territory acknowledgement, but part of my teachings is that we recognize where we're coming from and we recognize our point of departure. Um, and part of that is from Len for teaching me that. Thank you so much. Um, so I had introduced that I am of the Inslaklatma Nation um, and I'm coming to you today as someone who's practicing both cultural safety and humility. And oftentimes there's so much focus on the cultural safety piece that we forget about humility. And humility is recognizing that we're all learning, that we are a learner, that we're going to make mistakes. And so today I'm gonna to be sharing with you my teachings. And these teachings are, are, not, are not static. Um, they're they're ever-changing. Um, and they're not applicable to every situation, every person, or every setting. So today you're getting a glimpse of what I have learned um, along the way in my journey. And it might not fit for everyone. I recognize that there are so many knowledgeable people, um, knowledgeable Indigenous people as well, that, that signed up today and might be with us. And so I want to recognize that your teachings might be different than mine. Um, but today I'm here to share with you where I'm coming from. With that, uh, I want to acknowledge where I'm seated on today. 
Um, so I'm phoning in from the shared, unceded, and unsurrendered territories of the Kwantlen, Keitsi, Semiamu, Tawasin, Kakite, and Kwikwetlam First Nations, uh, which is colonially known as Surrey. I have lived here almost all of my life. I, I spent some time um, living in Aldergrove. And I did make my way back here due to work, but I, I am really grateful to be able to do this work and to just have a voice as an Indigenous woman on these lands, in these territories. And these are beautiful, beautiful territories. Um, and I'm so grateful to be able to do what I do in these lands. Thank you. So we are going to start off just getting right into the definitions of cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation. Um, so I want to start off with, you know, probably the negative one. You want to end on a positive note. Um, so cultural appropriation, just as a general definition, is the adoption of one or more elements of a culture by another culture. Um, and this is usually passed off as someone's own work. So where you might be able to, where you might see this is um, people wearing regalia, like you see here at the Victoria's Secret Fashion Show, uh, traditional items or taking art styles and passing it off as their own. Some examples of this are selling dream catchers as a non-Indigenous person. And we're gonna have lots of questions at the end uh, that I'm happy to answer. But this one is the one that really pops up a lot. Uh, lots of people, there's tons of dream catcher kits. You see them at Dollarama, I, you see them at Walmart. Um, and, and so I have a lot of questions around those. And so we'll get into that in a little bit, but that is an example of cultural appropriation. Um, whenever you see boho style, usually that involves some form of cultural appropriation of indigenous culture. Music festival culture, you will see a lot of headdresses. You'll see a lot of regalia that's passed off as fashion. Um, and Halloween costumes are a really, really big example of that. So let's move into cultural appreciation. Uh, so this is the act of respecting another culture by including it or supporting that culture directly. Um, so this could look like supporting Indigenous businesses, artwork, and other services directly from the Indigenous people we're wanting to support. Um, so some examples of this are purchasing an orange shirt for Orange Shirt Day from a reputable company um, that donates to residential school survivors buying it directly from the Orange Shirt, Shirt Society um, or buying them from residential school survivors themselves, uh, purchasing Indigenous style beadwork from an Indigenous person, uh, doing research on companies before you purchase items. I have found myself, uh, if we've been to Soft Mock, if anyone's been to Soft Mock, they have a lot of moccasins there. Um, and I found myself Googling certain companies just to see if they're Indigenous owned or not. And I do that right in the store. Um, so that is just an act of making sure that we're supporting the right businesses and making an effort to understand the significance of the culture that's shared with you. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit about what has happened in Canadian history, both contemporarily and um, historically, and it has not been kind uh, to Indigenous people. So understanding what the culture has been through will help you appreciate it more when we have access to it. So we're going to jump right in to the historical context. Uh, some of this may be a refresher for some of you. Um, Len spoke a little bit about some of these at his last session. If you were at the Transformative Territory Acknowledgement one um, a couple weeks ago, he, he definitely spoke about some of these. So it might be a good refresher. Um, it might be new information, but we're just going to go through four main um, instances in history. The first one is the anti-potlatch law. Uh, so from 1884 to 1951, it was illegal for Indigenous people to practice our culture. Um, it really just have any ceremonies, naming ceremonies. Specifically, it was the anti-potlatch law, but it included other ceremonies and practices. Uh, so Sundance, smudging, prayer, cleansing, any of that. Um, and not only was it just banned. You couldn't own cultural items. If you were found with them, they were seized by the government. Um, they were taken away. It was illegal completely to practice our culture. So when 
when we have these teachings around how to make dream catchers, that is something that survived many years of being outlawed. Um, I had someone, I, I forget who it was, but they taught me that oftentimes when you go to uh, Indigenous communities, sometimes you'll see um, blankets on the windows and they're beautiful decorative blankets. Um, but some people just, they, they're not understanding where that really comes from. And what I was taught is that those blankets that were on the windows is what kept the culture alive. Um, because at the time, an Indian agent would come around, peek through the blinds, and try and catch people who were still practicing culture. And if they were if they were seen doing that, they would burst through the door and put them in prison for no less than two months and up to six months. Um, and so these blankets on the windows rather than curtains stopped the light from coming through as much. And it's what kept our culture alive. And so when we see these blankets, picture it more so as why we have access to culture today. The, the bit of culture that we have preserved, a lot of that is thanks to people practicing in their kitchens or in their living rooms. The other thing that I want to go through that really tried to wipe out the culture is residential schools. And this is a lot of people are already aware of residential schools, especially with the first 215 children uh, that were recovered from the Kamloops Indian Residential School site. Um, and since then, between Canada and the US, I believe we are at 11,000. Um, and so there's there's this big uproar of people actually understanding these were not just schools, these were not just segregated institutions. There was abuse beyond what we can imagine, um, and part of that abuse was not being able to practice culture and speak your language. Which and I'll speak to these a little bit more in a little bit. Now the sixty scoop was when the government began implementing a new assimilation policy by forcibly removing Indigenous children from their homes and communities and putting them up for adoption with white middle class families or into the foster care system. Um, by the 70s, 60 to 70 percent of the children in care, all children in care, were Indigenous. And so the 60s group was just yet another assimilation attempt to remove Indigenous people from access to their culture and their teachings. And then we have the white paper, uh, which was proposed in 1969 by uh, Jean Chrétien and Prime, Prime Minister at the time, Pierre Trudeau. And this proposed to repeal the Indian Act and basically amend the Constitution to eliminate all references to Indigenous people. And although a lot of people agree <laughs> that the Indian Act itself is a very discriminatory, very sexist, very racist act, um, completely removing it and having all Indigenous people assimilate, uh, which is the wording that they had used into Canadian society, was not the way to do that. So these are all just minor glimpses at assimilation attempts um, and attempts to wipe, wipe out our culture as we know it. Excuse me a minute. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting allergies or, or something, so. Pardon me, I'll have to use a Kleenex every now and then. So the anti-potlatch law, just to expand on it a little bit more, um, during these years, it was fully illegal for Indigenous people to gather uh, in any form of ceremony or cultural practice. So if you were at the Territory Acknowledgement Workshop, Len had said uh, that we couldn't gather in six or more. And lots of families have six or more people. So that definitely complicates things. Um, but it was fully outlawed for us to practice our culture. And the, the missionaries and the local officers uh, deemed it as anti-Christian. And I believe what I read, what I saw in my readings was that it was a waste of resources, I believe. Um, and that's, that's what they had deemed it at the time. So our culture was completely villainized and demonized and just seen as this horrible um, that shouldn't shouldn't be practiced. So any cultural items, like I said, so masks, drums, regalia, uh, these were seized by the by the Canadian government. 
So residential schools, bringing us back here, um, children were very much punished, uh, and I want to say beyond punished. I, when I teach these courses, I want to, I want to be aware that these words may have a very activating response for people. Uh, so please take care of yourself throughout this this next little bit that I'm talking about. Um, but, but children, when we think of the word abuse or punishment. I find that my brain kind of caps out at a certain level. It, it has these examples of what I would consider abuse. And then it moves beyond that. And we have other words for it, like torture. And this is what the children experienced at residential school. Uh, both of my grandparents went to residential school. Um, my grandma, Doreen Sampson, and my grandpa, uh, Donald McIntyre Sr., they both went to residential school in Lytton. And unfortunately, they passed away uh, when I was very young in a car accident. So I, I didn't have a chance to talk to them or, or see them fully heal um, or interact with them as an adult. But it, it had an effect on our family, 100%. And so I remember my grandma buying me a dream catcher making kit from Walmart um, because she she saw it and, and that was our access to culture at the time when I was very young, like too young to appreciate it and too young to even have the dexterity <laughs> to make a dream catcher. But she sometimes that is our access to culture. Sometimes it's not as as easy to re-enter these spaces and so for her buying that from Walmart although the kit it was fully a, a kit made out of cultural appropriation um she recognized it as her culture and and brought it to me and I just I have that memory uh it's a very core memory for me and I think it's very sweet but I guess that that's one piece of of cultural appropriation that that is a very formative formative moment for me. Um, so with residential schools, culture was was not allowed. Um, children were punished for speaking their language. So a lot of languages were wiped out through these years. And there's this big misconception that residential schools closed so long ago. And I think that has to do with the fact that they opened so long ago. Um, when we think of, of these concepts like residential schools, we think, oh, well, those only probably operated for like 10 or 20 years. People don't realize that it's like over 160 years of residential schools in Canada. So when they see photos from the 1800s, they're like, oh, well, they closed so long ago. But the truth is they closed in 1996. And I've been seeing some evidence to further suggest that some of them closed in 1997 or even 1998, um, operating under what would have been referred to as a day school at the time, but still operating like an in an in house, fully lived in residential school. Um, so there's there's some mixed responses on that, um, but I I fully believe the survivors that that went there, and so I'm I'm gonna give you 1996, but please. Keep in mind in your in your hearts um, that it the last one could very well have closed in 1998 as well. So this wasn't too long ago. When people think of residential schools, they think of like, oh, this is something that my great great grandparents lived through or my great grandparents lived through, and it's not. There's so many people here um, that were 26 years ago. Like you have children that age, um, and I've worked with so many residential school survivors that uh, you wouldn't think would be. And you could have a 30 year old that actively went to residential school and actively remembers it. So just keeping that in mind that it's not so long ago that this happened. It's very recent history. I, I wouldn't even call it history. It's colonialism is still a very ongoing issue, but residential schools is very fresh, very new. And it's not something that was taken, that had a light effect on communities. Um, so, yeah. So 
considering all of that and considering how how our culture was treated and how the culture was attempted to be wiped out where do we see it? Where do we see cultural appropriation? Um, so I'm giving you some popular examples. One of them is with the boho designs. Um, you'll see dreamcatcher woven style macrame um, or knitting or crochet. And these are often incorporated in that interior design. Also Halloween costumes. I think this is where people hear about it the most. Um, Halloween costumes is really where it it comes out where it rears its ugly head um spirit halloween has so many of these this is just probably the best photo i could get of one but there's also one called reservation uh royalty they've become cl more clever with the wording but there was one a few years ago that quite literally said indian princess um this is not good <laughs> especially the halloween costumes we have i mean yesterday was um yesterday was valentine's day and on february 14th there's a women's memorial march um in vancouver so if any of you were there that's wonderful thank you for attending um so this is very very fitting for for what we're talking about when we have these halloween costumes that take our regalia and take very significant cultural items and turn them into this. It's just kind of a mockery or something that people wear as a costume. Um, it contributes to the fetishization of Indigenous women and our culture. And that is extremely, extremely harmful when we have missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people, and so many of them. That is something still very much ongoing. We also have fashion, and this one is going to break some hearts. I'm not going to lie. Um, when I first when I first talked about this, when I first presented version one, uh, when I started at Fraser Health, I showed this particular TNA hoodie or this TNA sweater, and so many people were upset. <laughs> it was very popular and and apparently very comfy. I never had it. Um, but I think a lot of people recognize this. This is the couch and sweaters. Uh, it's designed fully appropriated and taken for a huge major corporation and an extremely popular sweater design. Um, and so I know that some of you in here probably have one of these hanging in your closet. And uh, that one's tough to navigate because you probably spent good money on it. But unfortunately, it is an example of cultural appropriation. <laughs> um, and then this last one here is some of our cleansing practices, particularly smudging, is commonly appropriated. And usually when you see things like witch kits or witch ceremonies, um, and it includes sage Specifically, white buffalo sage is is one that is appropriated a lot um, and taken and harvested not in a good way. That is a huge form of cultural appropriation that is very damaging to Indigenous people and to our practices. So another example that I wanted to give a lot of you, because this one, um, this woman is very much thought to be Indigenous. Um, I've gone to Indigenous gift shops before, and I've seen Sue Coleman's work up there. The most recognized one that you'll probably see is here on the right. It's the Orcas, and it is cut off a little bit. But if you've seen this style of artwork, this woman, this artist, is non-Indigenous. And I think when you look up the bio, um, she says something along the lines of elevating Indigenous art by doing it, but she's she very much profited from it. She still does. From the best of my knowledge, she doesn't practice this style of art anymore, and it specifically says that she's non-Indigenous um, from this point forward, but that was after um, being called out, being questioned, and there, these designs are everywhere. They were on masks. Um, I saw so many just like during the height of the pandemic when everyone was getting really cool masks and, and beautiful designs. 
there were Sue Coleman designed masks that so many people were wearing. And there's lots of Indigenous people that also believe that she is Indigenous just because of her prevalency in Indigenous spaces. Um, so watch out for this. Usually when I go to a place uh, to buy some art, I always Google the artist and I always double check uh, because this one also broke my heart. My Nana has so many of these <laughs> um, and they're beautiful. Like this salmon one is gorgeous, but unfortunately she is not an Indigenous person. She's not First Nations, coastal, any of that. Um, so these are some things to watch out for. So wanted to give you some takeaways and I am mindful of the time. Um, I, I'm probably gonna talk for about 40 minutes. So another 10 minutes and then we'll have tons of space and time for questions. Um, so some takeaways, putting it all into practice. Here are some general rules. If the act includes Indigenous people, it's usually appreciation. So we consulted with an Indigenous artist, and this Indigenous artist is coming up with a design based on our vision. That is appreciation. You are getting an Indigenous artist to create something in collaboration. If it's including them, it's usually appreciation. If it's about Indigenous people, so native inspired indigenous inspired that's usually appropriation these are some these are some general buzzwords or buzz feelings to look out for to be able to recognize and label it as what it is native inspired is not a good sign and if it feels wrong it probably is double check google is your friend um and if you are shared teachings pass those teachings on. And one of my protocols is to name the person who taught you. Um, and what that looks like is when you're teaching someone, let's say you are gifted, you're a non-Indigenous person, and someone teaches you how to make a dream catcher. That's great. You can make dream catchers. You just can't sell them or profit off of them. So if you're teaching someone and saying, this is what I learned, this is how I was taught, you say, this is the person who taught me. This is how they taught me how to do it. And people are going to figure out their own way. But naming where that information is from, naming where that knowledge is from, is oral tradition. And it's passing on what you've learned and really an Indigenous teaching. So. Some of you may have already put this in the chat, but I want to go over three main frequently asked questions that I get um, about cultural appropriation and appreciation. The first one is, can I wear Indigenous jewelry as a non-Indigenous person? Everyone asked, can I wear beaded jewelry? Can I wear beaded earrings um, and, and necklaces? Yes, you 100% can. Just make sure you are buying from Indigenous artists. It's art, it's culture, it's not regalia, well, it can be regalia, but most of the time, it's not for the purpose of regalia. Uh, if we are selling, <laughs> if we are selling beadwork, if we are selling barrettes that are beaded, that is free game. If you're purchasing it from an Indigenous person, you go right ahead and you wear that. Um, an Indigenous person taught me to make dream catchers. Can I make one for my friend or family member? So as long as you're not profiting off of the culture and giving it as a gift, that's totally fine. An Indigenous person taught you this knowledge. When I worked at Frafka, we had culture nights and we, it was welcome to everyone. We welcomed everyone of all cultures and we taught them how to make medicine bags, how to make dream catchers, um, how to make moccasins. And so this is something that you know, that that can be teachings for everyone. But what we ask is that you don't go, you take that knowledge and then you profit off of it because Indigenous people had to fight for all, our culture to remain and, and for us to have access to it today. And with it being illegal for so long and, and just absolutely villainized for non-Indigenous people to then in today's society, make money and profit off of the culture that was banned that's it it's quite literally like a slap in the face really um it's not appreciating where it comes from and it's it's taking away from indigenous people 
Uh, keeping in mind also that lateral appropriation can occur. So some indigenous nations can appropriate from other indigenous nations culture, uh, which itself usually stems from colonization. With us losing so much of our culture, we had to turn to our peers from other nations to fill in some of those gaps or, or get some of our teachings back. And so sometimes you'll see someone um, practicing culture that isn't necessarily from their nation or they've been displaced due to the 60s scoop. And so they have different teachings than what their nation would have. Um, so keep that in mind as well, that appropriation can happen laterally. And how do I know if a company is Indigenous owned? Like I said, Google is your friend. I Google people and, and companies in the middle of the store, just super quick. Um, it's usually safe, but not all the time. If it says Indigenous owned or Indigenous run, and some red flags are inspired. So Indigenous inspired, Native inspired, those are the things that you kind of want to raise an eyebrow at and maybe do a little bit more digging on. So when we have cultural appreciation and practice, whether that is, you know, wearing Indigenous jewelry, um, it increases our visibility. I, I teach a lot of these courses for healthcare workers. And what I say is when you're wearing anything in, like an Indigenous uh, design scrunchie in your hair or, um, or a ring that has indigenous carving on it. I immediately block that. I notice it right away and I immediately feel safer with that person for the potential that they either appreciate the culture or are part of the culture as well. Um, and it's a sign of potential allyship. When you are buying from indigenous people, you're wearing their jewelry or you're wearing um, an orange shirt that really shows that you could be a safe space and you're highlighting Indigenous voices and our culture at the same time. So where can we support Indigenous people? There are tons of Facebook groups. Um, one of them is Shop Indigenous Women's Market with an exclamation mark. Um, that one is specifically for Indigenous women to spirit people to sell whatever they're selling. It could be t-shirts, it could be beadwork, um, it could be businesses, but that is a group that I'm a part of and they have tons of posts all the time. That's usually where I buy from. Just do keep in mind that there are a lot of uh, scams when you buy from Facebook groups. So just do your research, you know, check in, make sure that they have some reputable reviews before you buy online. You can support Indigenous authors. There are two that I know of, Indigenous-run bookstores downtown. There's Massey Books and Iron Dog. Uh, there's also Raven's Read, which is a subscription box of Indigenous um, artists and authors. And then you can go to Indigenous markets and stores. There are so many public markets where people... Like there was one in New West where you can just walk down and there's tons of vendors and it's specific for Indigenous artists, um, just creators, everything. And this photo here is from the Cedar Root Gallery, which is the store attached to the Vancouver Friendship Centre. So there is tons of accessible ways to support Indigenous businesses, buy from Indigenous people, um, and really practice appreciation. So with that, I want to leave enough time to answer some questions. I'm seeing, I'm seeing quite a big number in there. So um, I'm going to leave that time. But for those of you that have to leave, I want to thank you so much for being here and sharing space with me. Um, this is my contact information. If you wanted to email me after, you are more than welcome to. Here is Len's website, which has tons of um, tons of knowledge and teachings, and he even has his slides up there for people to use. Um, and I also wanted to put the next Lunch and Learn session up there. I know that Len is probably going to talk about it, but it is Indigenous Allyship. It'll be with Len, um, and it's February 23rd. So if you already signed up, that's good, because I think that one might be sold out as well. <laughs> well thank you. 
Hoichka. Thank you so much, my good friend, Marissa uh, Konechko. Um, thank you for that. Uh, we have <laughs> a huge number of questions coming in in the chat box. And on the topic of, of slides and making this, this information accessible on the website, uh, one of the first questions was if you would be comfortable making your slides available uh, after the session. We can email them out to the participants or we, I'm happy to host them on the website as well. Sure, we can def we can find a way to do that. I'll connect with Len. Um, I am more than happy to share these slides. It's it's not my knowledge; it's the knowledge of many people. Um, so yeah, we can figure a way out. Figure a way to do that. It might be too big of a file to email, so we'll get back to you. <laughs> awesome, sounds good. Um, okay, so let's dive into the questions. I'm going to try and sort some of them, and of course, group some of the, uh, of them because some of them came in around the same time and around the same topic area. Um, one of the first ones was around. Um, oh, I see lots of non-indigenous businesses selling crafts. They usually advertise that a certain portion of the the you know sales are donated to an indigenous charity. For example, orange t-shirts are sold and 10% of those sales are donated to Orange Shirt Society or the RSS, right? Um, how can we as Indigenous peoples address that? Oh my goodness. Um, I would say like just first off as a consumer, it's easy to find places that don't donate only a portion of sales. Um, I was walking around London Drugs around like I think in October, and they still had a sign up that said 100% of the proceeds from their orange shirts go to the Orange Shirt Society. Um, so it's very easy to just avoid those places, but as Indigenous people, sometimes we don't have access to it. Um, we don't have access to su supporting those businesses. So there are some situations where, um, you know, you might have to go to Walmart um, as an Indigenous person to, and and just really as anyone that, that has, you know, try your best to have access to it, but recognizing that that sometimes we don't. And so if you do go to Walmart and the prices are a little cheaper and they still donate a portion of the sales, that's still a portion that that would be going to those those places. So at the end of the day, we're all just navigating at the best we can trying our best and it's really a point of reflection as well and a teachable moment that if this is all you have access to right now that's okay but remembering in the future when you do have access to buying from other places to to give that back to to put that karma back into the world hi chica thank you uh, a comment in the in the uh, q a box Thank you for clarifying the Sue Coleman example, as I've often wondered in the past if she was in fact Indigenous or non-Indigenous. Uh, this person had a hard time finding those details, but uh, really glad to know the truth is now known. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, one, uh, Quite a few questions came in, in the chat box and comments uh, for this particular one is if we can go back to the practice of smudging, um, fully honoring and recognizing that there are some uh, cultures um, who have practiced uh, smudging for a long time. So Pagan uh, was mm. was mentioned. Um, so what kind of parameters or context would you say that that is appropriate or inappropriate for cultural appropriation? I think they would have to do a, a lot with research. Um, I don't know a lot about which medicines are used in Pagan culture, but I do know that ours are very specific to indigenous smudging um i also and i could be completely misspeaking so again i'm a learner um i don't believe that in paganism it's called smudging either um so when you see those two words kind of put together that's usually a red flag the burning of medicines is not something that is completely just owned by indigenous people like you said there are tons of other cultures that have been doing this but just keeping in mind that when there's a mixing of that it has to do with a lot of research what medicines were they using in pagan culture what medicines do we use in indigenous culture and making sure that that differentiation is very clear in your mind mm -hmm. 
I think I would, I would also add on to that is just the context and the intention in which smudging is, is being requested or being mm. practiced. I mean, like for, you know, in today's day and age, we have so many requests for, you know, blessings or ceremonies that are Indigenous specific and want to be Indigenous run and led because of truth and reconciliation and reclamation and cultural learning. So given what you've provided us to on the context of it used to be illegal for us, you know, we don't want those spaces to be taken up by cultural appropriation when it's really intended for Indigenous ceremony by Indigenous practitioners in an Indigenous uh, specific uh, type of context as well. Um, uh, another question is, what are your thoughts on tattoos? If the tattoo artist mm. is Indigenous and created the art and they were compensated, is this appropriate? So this one, actually, I was waiting for it to come up. This is fully, fully mixed reviews. Um, mm. It depends on Indigenous person to Indigenous person. Some are like, absolutely not. That's completely on your body forever. Other people are like, well, it's it's art and you're supporting an Indigenous person. Um, I myself, I have a tattoo that is post Salish design from someone who is um, someone who's a Métis artist, but he studied under elders um, and artists that were Coast Salish that gifted him the knowledge um, and gifted him the ability to tattoo in that design. And he taught me teachings with it as well, how you do the eyes last. Um, there's there's traditions that go into that. So if you are going to get a tattoo and it is Indigenous art, make sure that it is with an artist that should be doing that style of art, especially if it's going on your body forever. You don't, you don't want that energy. Um, but for that, I can't really answer. My opinion is it depends on what it is. Um, it depends on what you're getting on your body, what the animal is, what the design is. But some people are like, yeah, sure, free game. And other people are like, absolutely not. So I don't have an answer. And I'm sorry. <laughs> I would agree. It's a little bit of a trickier one. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember when I was a teenager and I wanted to get my very first tattoo. I wanted it in like, uh, um, I don't know which, which what, what the alphabet would be called, but it was like an Asian inspired type of style, right? Written in that kind of language. Um, and now today, like now that I've come so far on my own learning journey, learning about appropriation, I wouldn't necessarily want, you know, let's say, Hunkamina, my traditional language, you know, on somebody else's uh, body if they didn't do the work or if they didn't have that relationship. So I think it really comes down to the intimacy of the relationship you have to that person and that artist and the meaning of of the tattoo too. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that kind of comes to mind. Yeah. Um, is it appropriate for non-Indigenous people to purchase and wear items uh, like authentic moc moccasins? For example, Manitoba mukluks or beaded jewelry uh, or the couch and sweater from Indigenous companies? I think so. Um, if it's not regalia, like if you're not purchasing like a jingle dress or a fancy shawl or something, that's fashion. Um, like the, the couch and sweaters are, are sweaters to keep you warm and jewelry is, is fashion. Um, so I think that that's completely appropriate. Hmm. How'd you go? Um, question in, in the, that came up was going back to the example of the spirit Halloween and Indigenous mm -hmm. peoples being made into Halloween costumes. If it were to be done in with several other steps, like um, if the spirit Halloween or the costume designers engaged, included, and gave back to the Indigenous community, mm -hmm. would that quote unquote rectify the situation? Would they, you know, uh, they would still be making money, um, but does the sharing of a piece of that with Indigenous group make it any better? I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think that our, our culture and our likeness should be um, simplified down to a costume or or brought down to something that you put on and take off at the end of the day. Um, indigenous people, especially unlike myself, like I'm very aware that I'm white passing and I walk through society with the privilege of perceived um, like white privilege. I would never be discriminated against as an indigenous person unless I make that known, unless I volunteer that. And that comes with white privilege, um, which I hold. And I'm very, very open about holding that. But other people can't take that off. People 
can't take their costume, for lack of a better word, they can't take their indigeneity off. And we're still dealing with systemic oppression and racism and like person to person even, um, interpersonal racism that people experience on a day to day basis. If you take a look at any Facebook comment section on any any article uh, that has anything to do with indigeneity, any indigenous culture, anything, there is still so much racism. And to have our culture used as a costume when we are still not being treated with respect and kindness, there's just no space for it. So I would say hard no. Um, yeah, that's my answer. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of questions that I'm trying to uh, group together in terms of, of my mind and how to how to ask this. Uh, a lot of folks are, are really appreciating this session and know that there's definitely a need for it. I mean, in a time of truth and reconciliation, there's a lot of people who have, you know, well intentions for uh, appreciating Indigenous culture, but it's coming across as a lot more like appropriating it. That's what people mm. are saying. People are wondering what are some simple steps that they might be able to take to talk about appropriation with, with people that they know or how to um, introduce it in a conversation. Hmm. Well, you can blame me if you like. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's what I always say too. <laughs> yeah, you can say, "Hey, I took this. I took this course recently. It's actually on YouTube. You can take a look." Um, but I found it, I found it really interesting, and I found it really engaging. And I learned this, even if you've known it for so long, when you say, "Oh, I saw this thing recently," or "I learned this thing recently," it aligns your knowledge with that person makes them usually feel a lot more safe and open to make changes or change their mind or have their mind open a little bit more. Um, sorry, my cat is yelling at the birds. I don't know if anyone can hear that. No, we um, can't hear it. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so I would say just to start off, you can blame me. You can blame Len. I'll just, yeah. I'll throw his name out there too. Um, <laughs> and just say that you're also learning and, and you saw this and you made this change. Um, and just talking about it is a huge step that wasn't talked about before. There were decisions that were just made without us. People who are not Indigenous decided what was best for Indigenous people, how we feel, how we react to things, and we weren't even at that table. Um, so just opening that discussion and highlighting the voices that you've heard is probably the first thing that, that you can do, and, and then just feel the waters from there. Love that. Thank you. Um, is it appropriate for teachers to have students make totem poles in school in any form, mm. art, craft, wood carving, etc.? If not, what is an alternative or suggested activity? Thank you. Um, I, that's kind of in the same line as as dream catchers, right? Yeah. This um this actually brings something up. In grade four, I had to make. Um, I had to make a totem pole out of clay, like Crayola clay. And I remember making like a white tiger because they're my favorite animals. So there's a, a complete lack of knowledge around these, right? Um, and I, I found a photo of it recently, actually. I might share it because it's interesting. So, oh, goodness. Um, so I would say this one's tricky. If you have the capacity to bring someone in from that culture to do a workshop with your class, 100%. Um, if someone comes in, like, even from the Friendship Center or, or from uh, the local community, and you offer them an honorarium, sometimes they might not even want an honorarium. They just want, like, a, a, a small, like, a meal or something, and you share a meal with them. Um, if they come in and they can te have the teachings and they can do that with the class, first of all, that's one less thing you have to teach and you're getting the knowledge directly from the source. So I would say try and do that when you can. For totem poles, I don't have, I'm interior Salish, <laughs> so I don't have a lot of knowledge around um, totem poles. I do know that sometimes there are portions that are, that the public uh, can be invited to participate in and usually you have to go to sites like it would be a field trip and you go and you learn about it um, and the class can kind of participate in it together and they can they can whittle it a little bit like each do a little chip off um, 
that's probably your best bet. So yes, there's definitely space for it, but I think that we should adjust who is teaching that and who is teaching that knowledge if we can. Mm -hmm. I would also say too, just think, you know, as a, as a Coast Salish person, you know, in our, in our culture, it's, if you are teaching this in the lower mainland, you know, typically we do not have totem poles. We have welcome posts, uh, often with a male figurine and a, a female, uh, figurine with their arms raised up. And there's completely different teachings that go along with the totem pole versus, versus a, um, totem pole versus a welcome post, um, in these territories. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I would also think that, you know, you would also want to be, you know, as, intentional to be respectful of the lands and territories in which you're working to, um, because I think a good principle and practice is for, for cultural safety is that we want to learn on the land about the lands and territories and cultures, uh, and languages on which we live, work and play, and then start to kind of work our way out, um, as well. Um, a lot of praise is coming for you responding to <laughs> these questions, uh, with your answers, <laughs> with your good answers. Um, another question is, is saying indigenous language like, uh, quote unquote, in a good way? Is that something along the lines of, of appropriation? Because I know that's something that we say a lot in our culture, right? Or like we want to open in a good way. We want to close in a good way. What are your thoughts around that being uh, appropriation? I'd like to preface this by saying these are just my thoughts. They might not be the thoughts of many other indigenous people. Um, I think that a lot of the times when we talk about saying things like in a good way, usually, and especially Len, you do this a lot, you kind of explain what that is. You kind of like offer the teachings of what in a good way means. And so with that, if you're gifted that knowledge, that's knowledge that you can pass on um, unless it is like ceremonial. There might be different protocols around passing knowledge on, but something like that, I feel like for me, that would not bother me if someone did that. I, I would consider it appreciation even, especially if you explain where that comes from and where that phrase comes from. Um, also, another part of this is in a good, English isn't our language. <laughs> like at the end of the day, we wouldn't be saying in a good way uh, if it wasn't for colonization, we wouldn't be speaking English. Um, so that that's where things get, you know, a little bit, some people might think some way, some people might think another way. Um, but I think that something like that is is totally fine. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Um, an, an analogy that I use for people who want to respect and honor teachings that have been bestowed upon them or shared with them by practitioners or speakers like, like ourselves, uh, I always say is you want to be able to reference or cite <laughs> who gave you permission. Like for many of us on the call here, you know, we've gone to school or university or in high school and we had to cite, you know, who got their information from where so that, you know, you want to credit your source of knowledge and information. That's a demonstration of your relationship to that person. Uh, so often people ask me, they're like, oh, is it okay if I say Heichka and raise my hands instead of saying thank you? I'm like, I want you to say things like that. And if somebody ever asks you who said, gave you permission to say Heichka instead of thank you and raise your hands to somebody, I'm like, tell them me. I said, go say thank you in the language. Because when you go to Hawaii, what do you say? You say mahalo. When you go to Mexico, you say gracias. In our lands and territories, I want to hear people say Heichka and raise their hands because that's a, a respect, paying respect to the language of the territory and the people of these territories because you're on our lands and territories. <clears throat> But I always say that uh, uh, example of make sure you cite the person who gave you explicit uh, permission to go and do that. Um, let's see here. It's okay. Now it's like I'm coming through gratitude <laughs> and oh, appreciation and then questions. Um, oh, okay. This is a really good one. Um, can you speak a little bit about non-Indigenous uh, individuals being placed in roles like Indigenous support workers or roles like with Indigenous in the title um, mm -hmm. in, in organizations, companies, schools, uh, MCFD, First Nations Health Authority, and how this may be harmful or appropriate? Hmm. Very good question. Very difficult question to answer. I think it depends on each role individually. Um, like there are some roles that 
especially working with Indigenous clients directly, Indigenous people might feel more comfortable working with an Indigenous person. But there are other roles, um, and, and this has mixed reviews as well. Sorry, there's there she is. Um, this has mixed answers as well that I think that the education that we do like this does need non-Indigenous people to participate in sometimes. Um, because it's very exhausting for us and there's a certain demographic of people that aren't willing to listen to Indigenous voices saying this. Indigenous voices sharing about what happened with residential schools, what happened with the 60 scoop. And unfortunately, that demographic is going to need to be taught by someone who's not Indigenous. So it really depends on the role. Education, um, I think... I think there could be space for everybody, but there are certain like support workers that that there's trauma responses from people accessing um, accessing those those people or the people in those roles. Um, so for that, again, I don't really have an answer. It really depends, but I don't think that anything with the title like Indigenous this, Indigenous that, I, I don't think it's inappropriate for a non-Indigenous person to be in the role. It's better to have the role at all than, <laughs> than not have it because someone non-Indigenous is going to fill it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, love that response. Um, if you have already appropriated items, do you have any advice on what to do with them, such as donating them to thrift shops, reintroducing them you know, into the, the profit market? Are throwing them away in a environmentally uh, as, no, they're saying probably throwing them away is envi environmentally irresponsible. Um, any thoughts or ideas on on items that have been already appropriated? Oh, this one's so tough. <laughs> um, I would say like we're <laughs> we're in this age of there's a lot of wastefulness there's too much plastic on our earth <laughs> we we shouldn't be making more um so i would say it's a huge reflection piece i know everyone says that tna sweater is so comfy maybe it's something that you just wear around the house and you wear it with with your pajamas or you wear it to step outside to to when it's raining and you have to run to your car or something, but maybe not something that you wear to an event or something that's going to hi be highlighted. Um, oh, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I would say you don't have to, I mean, unless it's like a, a grotesque form of cultural appropriation, um, I would say you, you don't need to throw it out. Uh, that's just me that it seems wasteful especially if it still has use um just really reflect on it and if it can be repurposed that's really cool too like if you're a knitter um and you want to knit something else out of it like that's cool if you repurpose it that might be a really good use for it um but i would say try not to be wasteful in 2023 the best we can i know that it's it's a conflict but there's too much plastic so <laughs> do your best Love that. That's a brilliant response. And and I'm afraid that's all the time that we have for questions. We answered 21 questions, if not more, that were in the chat box and have about 40 that came in. So thank you, everybody, for all your wonderful questions coming in. And so sorry that we didn't have time for, for all of them. You have Marissa's contact information. This recording will be made live and available on our YouTube uh, page. Um, and we have lots of more resources that will be in development. So keep uh, uh, coming back, keep showing up to our, our, our these spaces. And th these are meant to be safe spaces for us to, to share and learn from, from one another and the incredible members of our team and partners and uh, relatives who have knowledge to share uh, with the world. So on behalf of all of our participants today, Marissa, thank you uh, for so much for all of your time, your knowledge and your wisdom. Um, and, and thank you, uh, for, for today. And thank you to all of our participants. We will see you at our future up and coming lunch and learn sessions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.